to coincide with COP28, the UN climate talks taking place in Dubai. And a warm welcome to Hogan Lovell's uh, office in central London. Hogan Lovell's, the global law firm, have been charity partner, uh, have rather, we've been the charity partner of Hogan Lovell's uh, for the last four years. And at the Wildlife Trust, we're enormously grateful for the huge support that Hogan Lovell's have given us over that time. And they've opened up their office tonight to an audience uh, part of this debate for Wildlife tonight with a fantastic panel to discuss uh, this enormously important topic around climate change and actually to ask the question whether there are any reasons that we might be hopeful on climate action. We hope to find at least one or two before the evening's out. We've got a fantastic panel for you tonight. We have Joe Lewis, who's the relatively new Chief Executive of Wiltshire Wildlife Trust and was previously Policy Director at the Seoul Association. We have Lord Diebden, who will be known to so many of you as the former chair of the Climate Change Committee, but also, of course, uh, a very long-serving uh, Environment Secretary of State in Margaret Thatcher's cabinet many years ago, and many other things uh, besides. We have Rachel Solomon-Williams, who's Chief Executive of the Aldersgate Group, uh, and I'll allow Rachel to tell you a little bit more later tonight about the Aldersgate Group. And we have Caroline Lucas, uh, MP, of course, for Brighton Pavilion, and the one Green Party MP we have in Parliament. So, audience, please give a warm welcome to this superb panel. And we're recording this on Monday night, the last uh, night or two, we will find out, of the COP28 talks uh, taking place in Dubai. And although the Wildlife Trusts haven't gone to Dubai, because we didn't want to get on a plane for this one, and we do go to a lot of international summits when we can go there by train, but we really, really think carefully about it before we go anywhere by plane, and we thought we, we weren't sure that it would necessarily add an awful lot to this one by going. Uh, our Director of Climate and Evidence, Catherine Brown, has been following it very closely from here in the UK. Now, there's been a lot of attention on COP28 over the last week or so, but I want to turn uh, attention to situation here in the UK as well. And our first guest tonight I'll turn to is Joe Lewis, Chief Executive of the Wiltshire Wildlife Trust. And Joe, just set the scene for us. Give us your brief reflection on where we are currently in the UK on what we should be trying to do is turn the tide on the climate and nature crisis. Well, I think... A uh, good place to start is to perhaps answer um, the question some of you might be asking in your mind as to why is a chief exec of Wiltshire Wildlife Trust uh, sitting on a panel to talk about global climate change? Uh, and I think there are, there are two answers to that, really. Uh, the first is that uh, the key test of all these global summits should be, um, do they stand us in better stead to accelerate genuine action on the ground? Um, and the second... Um, for me, Wiltshire is a farming county. Now, we're 80% uh, of the land in, in Wiltshire is farmed. Um, so it's incredibly important um, that food and farming um, are at the centre of action on climate and, and nature. I'm not sure how many of you are aware of the, the stats, but uh, food and farming is responsible for a third of emissions globally. Uh, and 80% of biodiversity loss. Um, so it's absolutely crucial that when we talk about uh, stock take um, in the UK and globally on nature and climate, that we are thinking through that food and farming lens. Uh, and uh, so bringing it back to the UK, um, I think it is important. You know, we are, we are under the banner of reasons to be hopeful um, this evening. Quite challenging after that update from Catherine. Um, but it is quite important to acknowledge um, that the direction of travel that this government, uh, and Michael Gove in particular, has set us on around reform of farm payments is the right one. Uh, it, and you know, that uh, is something that could not have been taken for granted um, a few years ago. Uh, the challenge comes from the fact that uh, the ambition seems to have been managed down. We don't have, at the moment, uh, the budget attached to uh, those farm payments for nature-friendly farming that matches the scale of need. So we urgently need to double the level of funding um, associated um, with that. 
Uh, and we also need to make sure uh, that farmers can call on uh, the advice of independent uh, and well-trained advisors uh, and not continue to rely um, on agronomists who are often uh, in the pay of agrochemical companies. So an urgent need for access to independent advice. Um, crucially, uh, we need to have more of a focus on nitrogen. And I think we're going to probably hear quite a lot um, this evening about, about carbon, uh, about methane. There was hopes for, a global, um, for the global methane pledge. Um, but not uh, many people uh, focus on nitrogen and nitrous oxide um, emissions in particular. And nitrogen, um, I would say, uh, and there is now a nitrogen collaboration of, of NGOs organising around this, um, is the key to tackling the climate and nature and public health crises uh, in a joined up way. Because the nitrous oxide emissions associated with excessive use of fertilizers, uh, they, it is a long lived gas uh, and it is something that it is a, a gas that needs to be brought down to near zero. Uh, it is also nitrogen the source of um, pollution of our waterways, um, pollution of the air, a lot of very precious habitats um, are now suffering from nitrogen deposition, ancient woodlands and meadows um, that we have in Wiltshire. Uh, so that is an area that the government needs to urgently focus on. Uh, and I would say that the Climate Change Committee to date has shown uh, brilliant leadership in a number of ways. I'm key, uh, aware that Lord Deben will speak after I've spoken in a moment. Um, one area uh, in which I think there's an import, it's important for the UK now to instruct the Climate Change Committee to, to, uh, to, to revise perhaps uh, uh, its, its outlook and its advice is on its farming and land use pathway. Now, I think in the past, the Climate Change Committee has felt constrained by its Climate Act mandate to just apply the climate lens when it comes to farming and land use. But we need urgently now to integrate, uh, to optimise that pathway for biodiversity. That would mean a significantly less focus on bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, uh, significantly more focus on cutting nitrogen use uh, and uh, achieving that uh, carbon sequestration in soils and trees on farms. Thank you, Joe. And just briefly, um, you know, there was, it'd be interesting to get your reflections of what we've seen from COP28 so far on this issue, because it was, it was much talked about in advance of COP28 that actually food and farming would get a lot of attention at this COP. Has that proved to be the case? Well, I mean, Catherine's update was, was uh, not encouraging, was it? But we did see on day two um, of, the, um, of the COP uh, a declaration, the Emirates Declaration uh, on Sustainable Agriculture, Resilient Food Systems and Climate Action. It doesn't trip off the tongue quite like the Emirates Stadium. Uh, but it was, I think, uh, it did feel like a breakthrough. It's now had um, more than 150 uh, world leaders uh, sign up to that. So that's three quarters of the parties. Uh, and it, it is, in many aspects, an ambitious um, agenda uh, that does talk about uh, the importance to uh, look at food systems in the round, look at um, them from the perspective of climate and nature and health, um, and really put farmers at the heart of this, because I think um, in our, in our uh, dependency, our global dependency on, on agrochemicals, in fact, um, as we know from a fantastic report that the Wildlife Trust, before I arrived, I have to say, uh, on, uh, as part of the Wildlife Trust movement, produced a brilliant report called The Sweet Spot, um, which illustrated... Um, well, evidenced very strongly uh, that uh, it is, you know, there is a lot of, um, uh, with a high output, high, high input, high output model that most farmers are dependent on, um, there is a challenge to profitability there. It's a treadmill that farmers are on. Um, and there is a sweet pot, spot for nature and climate um, and uh, profitability and viability of farming livelihoods that we need to achieve. So that's st the declaration, um, unfortunately, has not yet made its uh, cut through to the global stock take text, um, which is what we need to see in order to ensure that all countries will be including food and farming in their national climate plans, um, which is absolutely essential um, if we are going to close the gap um, with Paris. It's an issue that's certainly been very late to the climate game, it feels, in many respects, and certainly in terms of these international negotiations. And it's, it's starting to be mentioned, but it's still pretty small compared to the scale of the issue. Um, Lord Deibler, what would you say that we can take from COP28 so far? And, and what does it mean then for us here in the UK? Well, uh, 
I also think it depends what uh, what point you look at things. Now, if I if I go back to um, 10, 11 years ago, when I first became chairman of the Climate Change Committee, I'd never have thought then that we would have gone as far as we've done in those 10 or 11 years. Looking back, of course, I say to myself, we haven't gone anything like far enough. But it seems to me we have to keep those two thoughts in mind when we're talking now about biodiversity and, uh, and nature-based solutions and the rest. Because it's come, as you said, late to the whole uh, program. It's only, uh, I mean, the first really big change was the Pope's encyclical, uh, Laudato Si, when he made this very important point, which was that climate change was not the disease, it was the symptom of the disease. The disease was all those things that we'd done to the world, pollutioning, pollution of the seas, of the air, the way which we had removed the fertility of the soil, the damage that we'd done to the structure of the soil. And he has all those things together. And it seems to me that that was a crucial moment because people began to realise that you have to think of all these things together. Whereas I remember, you all remember, actually, even the young amongst you, you remember when climate change was one thing and the environment was another thing. Um, as before that, uh, aid agencies used to fight between the aid agencies looking after people and the aid agencies interested in the environment. And the environmentalists said that pe the others weren't interested in the environment and the people people said, well, you're not interested in the people. It's only now that they have understood that that this is all part of the same problem and they're fighting the same battles. So I'm encouraged by the fact that we are now seeing, horrible word, but it's the right word, a holistic approach to what we're trying to do. That is a huge change because it means that nobody can escape it in governments. And the fact that people have made this declaration and this number must be incredibly encouraging. The problem is always delivery. And for me, the thing that we get wrong in dealing with politics from uh, an NGO point of view is that it's always true that delivery is the problem, not just on the environment, not just on climate change, not just on biodiversity. It's everything. Politicians are much better at policy than they are at delivery. And it doesn't matter what party they are, it's always the same. And I'm just noticing it, um, uh, I think Caroline will explain, uh, say this, I mean, I, I now live in a, in a council which is run by, by the Greens, but they're having exactly the same problem, but it, the problem of actual delivery. When it comes to that, we're all in that problem. So for me, the issue now is how do we, as campaigners, get that delivery and help people to do it, which is why I keep on saying to people, don't just moan about this government, make it possible for whatever the next government is to do, to do it, not just talk about it. So I'm very keen that this is the moment that we take encouragement to make them deliver. And that's why I'm pleased about what the government says. I mean, after all, nobody could be more critical of it than I over a whole range of things. But I just say I'm very pleased about the, uh, the Steve Barclay's statement. I think it's, it really is build upon, it, you can build on it because it's got actual promises about actual things to be done which can actually be measured. And as long as we really press and we do one other thing, which is the rule of all of us, which is that when they get it right, say thank you. Because you'll never get them to do the next things unless you just occasionally say thank you. So often, <laughs> there's nothing to say thank you about. But when there is, then say that. And then say, and because I've said thank you, I can now ask for the next thing, which is, seems to me to be where we should be now. Let me then ask the next thing, which, which is, uh, you, you could say that the Prime Minister, his concerns over delivery is what motivated him in September to say that the UK needs to take a more pragmatic approach, was the phrase he used, in delivering net zero. What did you, what did you make of that? And what message do you think that sent, say, to international negotiators ahead of COP28? Well, you could say that, but it would be entirely untrue. I mean, the truth of the matter is that I think this was uh, another of those problems of government, which is that there are a whole lot of uh, special advisers who really have never grasped what these things mean, who clearly wrote that speech. I can't believe that anybody actually looked at it because 
there was so much nonsense in it. Who's ever suggested that we should have seven bins? The seven deadly bins story is entirely untrue. Nobody's ever suggested we have a tax on meat. Nobody's ever suggested uh, that we should uh, force people to share cars. We have suggested that people should eat less meat, and we have suggested that where car sharing is possible, we should all try to encourage it. And we have suggested that we should divide our waste. And the Welsh if I may say so, the Welsh Government is doing extremely well on that front, if only the rest of the United Kingdom was actually doing as well. But it, it, it didn't seem to me to be hanged together, because then what was the announcement? It was that we put off the date at which it's not possible to sell anything but an EV or equivalent. Well, <clears throat> in total effect, that's not going to be a huge one, particularly as he's kept all the other dates so that, in fact, it won't make all that difference. But what it does do is to undermine people's confidence in the government's word. Because in July, they said the date was immovable. In September, they moved it. Now, we've all seen this before, and it's also true of all governments. It was true of the coalition government. It was true of the Labour government. Governments <coughs> have to understand that if you want people to rely on governments and to do what you want them to do, you must not change things, even if you think you've got a better idea. Even if this were a better idea, you still shouldn't change it. Because once people have fitted their businesses, their operations and everything else into that, if you undermine that one, it means that you can't get them to do it next time. So for me, it was pretty meaningless, because I don't see that it did anything on either side that was really serious, but it did undermine ourselves and our international position. Much worse internationally, of course, was the suggestion that we're going to uh, license more oil and gas from the North Sea. Um, and just in case anybody says to you, oh, well, it's very important, it's our oil, and, and, you know, we have to buy it from somewhere else anyway, just remember three things. It isn't our oil in the sense it will be sold at international price, so we don't get any cheaper. Second thing is, by the time this stuff comes out, we'll be awash with oil or awash. It's one or the other. It'll be either we've done things properly and we'll be OK, or we'll be underwater. So we just have better understand that. And the third thing is simply this, the figures. I always like bringing people home to figures. Practical. What was the word? Pragmatic. In 2050, if we stop any further expansion beyond the immediate gas because of um, what's happening in the Ukraine, if we stop that, then the um, North Sea oil production will have fallen by 95%. If we exploit it to its maximum, it will have, rather, it will have fallen by 97%. If we promote it to its maximum, it'll be 95%. So the tiny difference that it makes is a few hundred jobs. When you think of the thousands of jobs which renewables could have to replace that, you will see why it's a nonsense, just as the ridiculous coal mine in Cumbria is a nonsense. And we just have to recognise it's a nonsense which gives hope and comfort to the people who don't believe in climate change and who will use that as a means of saying, yeah, well, they don't really believe it. When push comes to shove, then they give way. And that's why it's so damaging. Lord Edwin, thank you. Um, Rachel Solomon williams Executive Director of the Orders Gate Group. Um, first of all, just, do you want to just briefly introduce the Orders Gate Group? Yes, thank you. Um, the Aldersgate Group is a multi-stakeholder alliance, which is a mouthful, but what it means is we have about 70 uh, large organisations in membership, including some of the UK's biggest businesses. Um, so, for example, John Lewis, KPMG, um, Octopus Energy, you get the idea, alongside some wonderful NGOs, including the Wildlife Trust, who are a member of the Aldersgate Group. Um, and some non-profit organisations, including uh, academic institutions, the Crown Estate, 
lots of different kinds of organisation. And we're fairly unique in that sense, I think. So we're not a trade association. We simply uh, represent the position that we think um, action on the environment and on climate is absolutely fundamental to the business life in this country and that it makes good business sense um, to take that action. So all our business members um, have demonstrated that they themselves are taking action and they've, they've passed our due diligence um, to become a member of the Aldersgate Group. Uh, and, and that's our message. Thank you. So from your perspective, from your vantage point that you see, do you see reasons to be hopeful on this issue? Looking at COP, it's a matter of record that there are 90,000 different people attending this year. And those people are from every kind of organisation, including all the biggest businesses that you can think of. Um, and they're from every sector as well. I think if you looked at COP, 10 years ago, it would have been from a much narrower range of sectors, particularly the energy sector, for example. And now we've got major businesses of all kinds, including law firms, uh, for example, financial organisations, seeing this as a top priority for them. So um, whatever the outcome of the actual negotiation, uh, which I will leave to the experts to discuss, um, I think that the presence of so many businesses in particular and also civil society organisations seeing this, and I think as, as Lord Deben said, it's really a systemic issue now um, and everybody really understands that it is and we need to think about um, not only nature and climate as one problem to be solved together, but also the different parts of that system, the food system, transport, energy and all of those things as part of a, a total problem that we're working together on. I think we do have a reason to be cheerful because um, that is now much better understood. I also agree that the policy making is sort of going on for too long. We need to move into delivery, um, but that's a separate conversation. Okay. And what do you see as sort of like the particular areas? Are there particular sectors where uh, you see progress happening uh, really fast at the moment or, or other sectors where actually they seem to be moving quite slowly and they need a, something needs to happen to speed things up? I think it's really exciting what's happening in the financial sector. Um, we have a number of financial sector organisations in membership at the Aldersgate Group, and they are very encouraging and excited about um, the disclosure requirements, for example. It, it's a sort of surprising thing to say that financial organisations are keen on um, additional regulation that requires them to disclose what they're up to. But actually, um, it's incredibly useful because it shines a light on what's happening um, inside different other organisations and helps them to make business decisions. London is the... Um, global hub, I think, of uh, financial carbon reporting, uh, which is really exciting. And seeing that change happen very quickly over the last few years, um, we're now seeing a move from uh, TCFD, which is um, the Task Force on Climate Related Financial Disclosures, into TNFD, this equivalent framework for nature. Um, and the TNFD has been developed much, much faster than the TCFD was based on that learning. Um, so it's fantastic to see what's happening in the financial sector. Those organisations are now looking around for what to do with their money. And that's where the kind of challenge comes, because um, going back to that long term certainty problem, we need to understand from the government what they see as the future for all the other kind of real economy sectors. So how is transport going to evolve? Um, how, is, how is heavy industry in, particularly going, go, in particular going to evolve? What does the government think that the future of the steel industry should be in this country? Um, and it's really important that the government sets that out as clearly as possible and then puts in, in place a kind of delivery mechanism to make it happen. And that's what will bring then um, the finance into those sectors. And I think some of those real world, real economy sectors are struggling at the moment to make the case for investment in the UK. And that's not a lack of interest by them. It's a lack of being able to attract investors to, that, to their proposition because they can't demonstrate what the long term outlook is. And are you starting to see sort of even fractions in the business community? You know, some businesses want to go a lot faster. And of course, you still have dinosaur bits of the business community holding back. Do you start to see real tensions coming out with, across the wider business community on, on this agenda? I think in the UK, we're lucky to have a very progressive business community in general, um, more so than in some other parts of the world. Uh, I think if you look at the US, it's more polarised into those who are pushing forward advanced technologies um, and those who are very much kind of sitting on the other side of the fence to almost to the level of climate denial. I don't think that climate denial is something you'll hear in a boardroom in this country. Um, it's more a question of how fast can we go? Can we afford to kind of take that leap in terms of investment? Um, where's that balance between um, short-term security and long-term outlook? So um, 
there is, of course, a spectrum in the business community in this country, but I think we're really lucky that we've got a very clear kind of leadership approach. Um, it's not the case everywhere in the world. Great. Uh, well, thank you very much. We're looking forward to your answers in, uh, when we come to the q and I'll come to Caroline Lucas now. Um, there were, well, I don't know. I think there might be. Uh, Caroline, I'd love to actually pick up with you, in particular the relationship between these big international agreements and what happens at the big international cops and what needs to happen domestically and to what extent that plays down into domestic politics and to what extent the domestic politics plays back up into the international. What's your perspective as you've observed that over many years? Well, I think both of those things are, are true. Um, certainly, I think... Um, governments don't have so much credibility on the international stage if they haven't got their own house in order. And I think that's actually what was one of the most damaging things about the rollback that Rishi Sunak announced in September. As, as Lord Deben said, there wasn't that much, although we could perhaps talk at some point about, about rented accommodation and, and, and the, what was rolled back there when it came to the requirement for landlords to, um, to properly um, insulate their properties. But other than that one, um, the, the, the changes around boilers and cars were not that significant in themselves, but the message it sent, I think, was massively um, unhelpful. So right now, especially when we know that tonight, um, you know, there are these big debates going to go on around, you know, the fact that phase out and phase down aren't in the text at all. And I do worry that the UK has actually shot itself in the foot slightly because normally we've had a role of, of global leader but at a time when as Lord even said we've just given a green light to a coal mine and to 100 new oil and gas licenses and to the largest undeveloped oil field in the North Sea we're not in the best position to say to some other countries excuse me would you mind uh, agreeing to phase out fossil fuels so it matters and I think we shouldn't ever underestimate the fact that other countries do notice what we're doing it does it really does matter um, and, and the other way around too. I mean, I think it is important that when you've got um, uh, commitments that are made at these global um, summits, that does give you greater uh, leverage to try to ensure that your government then falls into line and, and meets them. It gives you another way of, of trying to hold them accountable, I guess. Um, do you see things that give you hope? I mean, you know, you, you'll be aware as all of us around this whole kind of climate debate, there's so many things that are cause of massive concern but what gives you what's given you real hope over the last few years um i, I wanted to answer that in in two ways actually first of all I, I wanted to make a distinction that a rather wonderful writer rachel solnit um rebecca solnit even sorry rebecca solnit a u.s writer um if you don't know her work i i warmly commend it and she talks really interestingly about the difference between optimism and hope and for her, optimism is sort of, you know, that kind of feeling that you're sitting on a, on a sofa clutching your lottery ticket, you know, just, just being optimistic that it's going to happen, but you're actually not doing anything to make it happen. And she contrasts that with hope. And she says that hope is something that you break down doors with in an emergency. It's something that gets you out there because you believe that something better can happen. There's no guarantee that it will, but you know that your actions will be part of that and can actually lead to a better outcome. And, and that kind of hope I, I certainly have. And I would find it, I guess, um, in, in the fact that, well, the economics of all of this is, is, is shifting us in the right direction. I mean, never mind the politics. The economics is such that renewables now are so much cheaper and faster and more effective than, than fossil fuels. And I think there's a really exciting story to be told about that. I would say young people make me hopeful, but I'm really also very aware that it's not fair to keep landing that on their shoulders as if they have to be the ones to make the rest of us hopeful after we've, frankly, uh, made pretty much a mess of, of their futures. So although it is exciting to see Fridays for Future and, and young people really being engaged with this debate, I, I'm also very wary that it shouldn't be them skipping classes uh, that is what gets us feeling hopeful and, and focuses mind. So I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that they do it, but they shouldn't have to do it. And just before I go to Q&A to ask, ask you for your questions tonight, just to pick up on it from all the panelists, that, that you talked about the, the changes in the economics around this, and you could say also around technology. There's something very exciting, isn't there, about how once we get over the real hump of this, we might actually see that change happens far faster than we ever predicted. I just want to say one thing, which is that that, that is true. Um, and, you know, you can look at all of the really positive stuff that's happening around renewable energy in particular. But that is, as nothing, 
if it doesn't actually substitute for the fossil fuels. If it's alongside the fossil fuels, that doesn't help us. I don't know if anyone saw George Monbiot on uh, Question Time the other, the other week, but he put it beautifully, saying that, you know, the fact that you've had um, a salad doesn't take away from the fact that if you've just had two enormous great buns, that doesn't help the fact that you're trying to lose weight, right? So, so the salad has to substitute for the buns in that analogy, and here... Uh, the renewables and efficiency and all of that have to substitute for the fossil fuels. They've got to stay in the ground. And the bit that worries me is that while we're so busy measuring how much progress is being made on renewables, rightly so, it's got to be as a replacement. We've got to stop eating the buns. Buns have got to go. Yeah. Lord Debian, do you want to say something like this? I know, I know this is something you've talked quite a lot about in the, in the past. Well, first of all, I, I entirely agree with that, uh, that definition of hope. It isn't optimism. It's a mixture of determination that we're going to do something about it and the fact that <clears throat> we're not going to be depressed into inaction. I mean, I think the danger always is, I find this, uh, I've always found this, is the biggest difficulty is you, you have to tell people the truth, which is that we are in a desperate position. We could destroy the means of life on Earth. We have that in our hands. Our overweening power as human beings have that. But that must not lead you to say, well, let's eat, drink and be merry because tomorrow we die. If you've actually got to see that as a, as a challenge. And once you see it as a challenge, then there is that real hope. I also think that the... Um, the business community, the finance community, um, um, and the farming community. I mean, we're talking about farming. The, the, the number of, when I started to farm, which is not all that long ago, um, but there, was, there were only two red pole cattle herds in our area, which was the traditional kind of animal. Now there are 12 or 13. And these are arable farmers who believe you should move to mixed farming and are talking about regenerative farming and the whole of this is changing. And when we set up a little group, um, a cluster for farmers, my goodness, some of those people who came through the door, you wouldn't have believed they would have thought because they would tease me 10 years ago, 20 years ago, because I've always taken the um, view that organic farming is something that really matters. Um, they, they're now beginning to say, very importantly, we can't go on like we are going on. Now, all that is very, very hopeful. And I think that the terms of trade, so to speak, are swinging against the um, fossil fuel and, and the old-fashioned ways of doing it, but not fast enough. That's why we have to press and push. I think that uh, Caroline was right. We have to bang down those doors and just say, we haven't got time to wait for you to be converted by your bank balances. We've got to get there quicker. Thank you. Joe, you look very keen to come in on this. Well, I was just, again, yes, we were talking about the economics, and I think, um, you know, I, I, there was a huge wake-up call for the farming community when fertiliser prices went up 300% in the space of 12 months. Uh, and, yeah, that... Um, really did prompt it it opened a door um because I, it's incredibly important there have always been believers that you know there were the incredible organic pioneers who against the odds um you know they decided that they were going to take responsibility for farming in a way that works for nature and the climate um and yeah it was a it was a her heroic and very challenging thing to do because if you haven't got the polluter pays if you haven't got um any public money for public goods um then you're taking all the costs on yourself as a farmer um, of saying we're not going to pollute, you know, we, um, even though there's no level playing field for us. Everyone else is pushing their costs onto the environment and onto people's health. We're not going to do that. We're going to internalise those costs and having to make that pay in the market with a premium that people then turn back and punish them for, um, you know, as if it was um, just some self-interested um, approach. And I, yeah, so I think it's really, really important that we, we that we stand up for the organic pioneers and we learn from them now. Um, but we are in a situation, you know different context now where finally government has woken up to we need to have uh, farm payments that are public money for public goods 
Uh, and then, you know, we haven't got the polluter pays yet, um, but we do have, uh, you know, we have seen that impact on fertilizer prices. Um, and it really is meaning that we're starting to see the emergence of a really meaningful incentive framework for farmers to make this transition because a lot of farmers want to make this transition, but they can't do it um, if it doesn't represent a, a viable and, and resilient livelihood. Uh, so one thing we have to get right on top of the, the farm payment reform is making sure there's meaningful access to, for farmers of all scales to private markets for environmental services. Um, and yeah, that, again, is an area where the government scored a big own goal um, with you know, nearly ripping up uh, nutrient neutrality. And uh, yeah, we were worried that the King's Speech would signal the arrival of a nutrients bill to get it in there through the back door. Uh, we, they've come back from the brink on that one. But immediately questions being asked around, you know, can we, re can we really invest in markets around biodiversity net gain? And the whole package, which is absolutely crucial um, to give that meaningful incentive framework for, for farmers and landowners to make those changes. Thank you. I might just come back to nutrient neutrality a bit later on, just for a bit of fun, really. Um, but uh, but let's go out for some questions right now. Uh, yeah, gentleman here. How can uh, we assist? Can you just wait for the mic to come to you? So uh, my name is Will. I'm from Just Stop Oil, and uh, I'm wondering how can we as citizens hold the government to account and get them to be leaders on reducing carbon emissions again? Um, is it time for civil disobedience? Is it time for direct action? Thank you. Caroline, shall I go to you first on that? You've said a thing or two on this in the past. Um, well, I think we need to use just about every um, nonviolent means that we can to, to try to make sure governments act and are held accountable. Um, and so I don't have any problem with peaceful direct action and as someone who was arrested and I should add acquitted uh, for demonstrating outside um, the fracking site in Bolcom um, some years back because fracking to me was the front line of the climate um, agenda just then. I think there is a role for peaceful direct action. Um, but there are plenty of people who don't want to do that, uh, in which case, you know, I would love them to be as active as they possibly can be in whatever organizations or, or, or employment site that they're in and make sure that this is something that is so mainstream that their organizations, their unions are, are putting pressure on their MPs and so forth because it's got to be something that is, that is really bottom up and right across the board. It can't just be certain sections of society doing this stuff. And I would say as well that, you know, sometimes you know, there are all sorts of things, aren't there, where, where you sign up to write to your MP, you know, 38 degrees or, or any number of these organizations. Um, but they do make a difference. E even better if you can write something that is your own rather than something that is very obviously written by a, by a third party organization. But you know, MPs do take notice, particularly MPs in, in more marginal seats. And even better if you can actually go and beard them in their constituency office and, and you know, eyeball them because they are your representative and you, you know that your vote is dependent on what they decide to do. So I think don't ever underestimate the amount of power that you can have and really try to leverage it in every kind of possible way you can. Lord Diedemann, is it worth writing to peers as well? Well, it's always worth writing, but I think, first of all, you, go, you don't just write to your local MP, you get an appointment. And if they ask you what it's for, you say it's a private matter between me and the MP. And you go. And you go and you talk about the constituency itself. You bother to find out where the flooding is taking place. You bother to do that. And that means that you begin to bring home... Members of Parliament are much more interested in what their constituents say than anybody else. So one does that. And there are no marginal seats at the moment. They're all marginal. So everybody, and they're all terrified. So out you go and you give them what for. And you make sure that, and you also go to the candidates. And don't think that all parties uh, stick to what their party uh, policies are. There are many members of parliament who are pretty wet on all these matters right across the, 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 the piece. So you want to find out about the member of parliament. You'll soon be able to do it because I'm just starting with my Labour, Liberal and uh, Welsh Nationalist friends uh, 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 a... Um, website, you'll be able to look up the new constituency and see what each of the candidates actually think about climate change. So you'll be able then to start lobbying them in a very direct way. 
But the second thing is, we've got to be much more intelligent about this. For example, if you want to have, I had a long conversation with two sisters, which are the biggest supplier of, of uh, chickens and other things. They've... Be clear that the company is called Two Sisters. Yes. It's not that you just... Yeah. Yeah. It's quite right. But they, I'm only just saying, the, the, the man who owns that, and it is a privately owned company, has decided that his first duty is to do something about climate. And this is a food company, isn't it? It's a food company. So you look at what they're doing and you look at other people and you make those choices. The other thing is we make choices. We must look at everything through the lens of climate change. What do we do ourselves? What does the, what does the golf club we belong to or the church or whatever else it is, what do they do and how can we change that? And then what does our local council do, our parish council, district council, county council, and then what can we bring to the Member of Parliament? We cannot complain about people not doing things if we don't use the techniques that we've got. Great, thank you very much. This next question, yeah, lady here. Second row, just wait for the mic to come to you, please. Thank you so much. It's been a fabulous uh, panel discussion. My name is Lizzie Crotty and I work with the Australian Wildlife Conservancy um, based here in, in the UK permanently. My question is, you know, we've heard a lot about quite localised issues and we're talking about localised nature and biodiversity and, and, and even climate. My question is about basically a huge percentage of the world's biodiversity being in a lot of other places in the world and in a lot of developing countries. So is there much appetite, um, thinking about what you were saying, Rachel, from businesses to actually invest in some of those areas that have a disproportionate amount of the world's biodiversity that's very quickly disappearing? Yeah, so Rachel, uh, how about that? Uh, that's a really interesting and complicated question um, because the answer depends on where in the world and how the incentive structures are set up around that. And I think it's a really evolving market at the moment. So um, international nature markets are probably the favourite topic of conversation for um, conferences that are being planned in 2024. Everybody's trying to work out how to get the money to where the problem is um, and how to turn that into an opportunity from a business point of view. Um, and in some cases it's kind of obvious how that might work and in other cases not so much. They need to be really careful that, um, so businesses are very worried about being accused of greenwashing um, for, for good reason, because they have been accused of greenwashing. Um, but it needs to not look as though they're spending the money to create an offset, um, if that offset would then be challenged um, for, in terms of its in integrity. So I think it's a really important live conversation now about how we help to, to generate a kind of value around those natural systems um, in other parts of the world. There is certainly interest from the business community to get into that space, um, if they possibly can. And it has begun. Um, but it's, I think it's early days at the moment, and it'll be really exciting to see where that might go uh, in the next few years. So, Joe, should British-based business invest in restoring nature here in the UK, perhaps even in Wiltshire, mm -hmm. or, or abroad? Or abroad. <laughs> well, I, I think you know, my first... Um, uh, my first response on hearing that question was thinking about all the ways in which um, the actions of businesses in the UK uh, and supply chains in the UK are driving those impacts um, offshore and particularly obviously the, um, the import of uh, animal feed for industrial livestock in the UK. Uh, so uh, there is, um, I think, a, you know, an area larger than Greater London um, that is currently dedicated to producing soy for just the, the livestock, um, uh, industrial livestock, so chicken and pigs um, and dairy in this country. Um, and so it's incredibly important hearing about two sisters. Uh, again, my question might be, you know, how, how do they reconcile their business model with where we need to get to um, as a country? Country, um, which is halving our consumption of industrial chicken um, let at the me, very least. Let me just show you why I think this is important. They are working now on a substitute for um, uh, soya. Their whole aim is that they will remove soya from the whole system. So they are actually aiming at the right thing. They haven't got there yet, but they're well on the way. And that's what we need is, if I may say so, action and delivery. 
Well, that's, uh, yeah, then let's hope they're also thinking about tackling the pollution of, of rivers and all that. Yeah, there's a, it's a whole nexus of horror stories at the moment, industrial chicken. Um, but that does sound like it is a, a, a meaningful step forward. Um, so, but then clearly, you know, we, we hope that um, uh, businesses will also be looking to uh, invest in their own supply chains domestically. So, you know, I wouldn't want to have um, the food companies, food retailers, um, food manufacturers, for instance, uh, just focusing on uh, perhaps the more easily marketable um, projects overseas that can be invested in, but not taking the opportunity to pay their own uh, supply chains, their own farmers, um, at the level that's needed in order for those farmers to farm in a sustainable way. Um, I think, you know, my nervousness is always that, um, you know, in the past, I think the, the focus and the investment has gone to uh, approaches which are around creating habitat in the margins um, and then in the middle of the field the, f the farming continues intensive as ever and we can't continue to put a fence around nature um, and pretend that we can carry on farming in the same way so really keen that uh, it's not just ESG commitments and offshore um, offsets but it is actually about reforming supply chains um, in this country and hopefully that will reach the farmers of Wiltshire. Joe, thank you. Uh, next question, please. Uh, yeah, lady here by the pillar. Thank you. Um, Hannah from Russia, UK. Um, I wonder, we've had some interesting news recently about the right to roam and a kind of a rollback on that. And I wonder just kind of if you could comment on access to green space and kind of maybe some of the opportunities, the risks, the ways that we as charities, NGOs and citizens can be kind of talking to farmers business leaders and politicians about greater access to land and to nature and to kind of equality of access to green space in the UK. Caroline, you've done a fair bit on right to roam. Do you want to say a bit on this and then I might come back to Joe? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Because um, I put down a private member's bill exactly trying to expand the right to roam and looking in particular at how it works in Scotland, uh, where they have a, uh, an assumption, a presumption that you've got a right to roam unless there are good reasons why not and there are some good reasons why not if there are ground nesting birds or if there are uh, you know animals in a particular field where you would um, you know go through it when it when they were uh, lambing or whatever else you know there are times obviously in places where you wouldn't want to roam but I think we could be expanding massively what we have in England and Wales just now at the moment uh, despite the Crow Act, the uh, Countryside and Rights of, of, of Way Act of um, uh, when was it 20 years ago um, we have, I think, the right to roam legally on just 8% of, of English land and 3% and of rivers. So that really could increase and should increase, I think. And one of the reasons I say that is because I genuinely believe um, something that a, a, another amazing writer, Richard Louvre, says in his book, Last Child in the Wood. And he says, we won't protect what we don't love and we won't love what we don't know. Um, and, and that sense of knowing it in a really kind of intimate way, not just knowing it from a footpath, although footpaths are hugely important, and one real consideration is making sure that the right to roam doesn't mean that those footpaths aren't upheld. And so I think, you know, in the coalition of, of organisations who are now talking about how we could expand the right to roam, there's a real awareness that we need to make sure that's not um, at the price of, of letting money come away from, from investing in those footpaths. But having said that, you know, really feeling at home in your in your environment and loving it and knowing it and feeling that kind of comfort and, and intimacy with it, it, it feels to me that that is so important in terms of equipping people then to be able to fight more effectively for it. And at a time, you know, there's that famous example, wasn't there, Craig, of, um, was it the Collins Dictionary or the Oxford Dictionary, one of those children's dictions, dictionaries anyway, some years ago, taking out words like bluebell and conquer and replacing them with chat room and bot. You know, that really did worry me. And I think there are, there are serious mental health concerns too, because we know and we saw through the COVID pandemic just how important access to nature is for our own mental as well as physical well-being. So there are just so many win-wins here. And it wouldn't be an expensive thing to do. And I think we could get farmers on side. I think we can learn from what happened in Scotland. There was a really painstaking engagement with farmers over time and recognising just the final point that the right to roam also brings responsibilities, obviously. Um, and, and, and there is a, 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 a sort of countryside act, but hardly not act, what do you call it? Code of, um, sorry, I'm so tired. Yeah, countryside code. Yeah, countryside code, that. There is that, and, and the government spent some uh, time uh, updating it quite recently, but no one still knows about it, you know? So, so we need to do far more in schools and so forth so that people understand uh, what their responsibilities are as well as their rights. 
Great. And Joe, from uh, at your perspective, from Wildlife Trust perspective, obviously it's a tricky thing in one sense that we absolutely exist to try and promote, you know, people getting close to nature, but we've also got to protect nature. How, what's your perspective on this? Well, actually, we've, um, in Wiltshire, uh, had the opportunity, uh, I've only been in this role for four months, and in my second month, I got to open a new nature reserve, um, which also had a new nature park, uh, so at Bay Meadows, which is a, uh, a lovely reserve. Um, we had, uh, were very um, lucky to have funding from the Heritage Lottery Fund, and we were able to uh, acquire an area at threat of development um, with a beautiful chalk stream running through. Um, vital corridor for otters and water voles and, and brown trout and the water team, which Wildlife Trust has a dedicated water team, we've been busy re-meandering, but it's, uh, it, it, it again was an option to us to be able to create a really dedicated space, um, a nature park for families to be able to, yes, walk the dog, have access to the river to paddle so the children could take their shoes off and, you know, actually get the little fishing nets in and catch the minnows and all those things that if we're honest, you know, um, if, if we were if we were trying to tiptoe around nature, we wouldn't necessarily have had the formative experiences as children, which make us love it. Um, so we do need to, um, to have that opportunity, make sure that people can, you know, starting from where they are, experience nature in a way that moves them. Um, but also there are some, some sensitive species and some areas that need to be protected. So, so that was the ideal. Um, I do think it's really important that we keep um, alive one of the more meaningful and tangible goals from the environmental improvement plan that the government launched, which was... Uh, for everyone to live within 15 minutes walking distance of, from natural green space. Um, so coming back to the question around, you know, what should you... Um, uh, was it beard your your prospective parliamentary candidate? With? Uh, I love that expression. So what what do you what do you uh, what's the challenge you put out um, to prospective parliamentary candidates to MPs? Um, I'm really saying, well, how are you going to bring that about? You know, how are you in this in this county in this constituency going to help um, make that a reality? Um, because you know, it really, is only when we start to achieve that and give you know every child growing up the opportunity to experience um, yeah, the, the joy of nature that we will uh, actually um, uh, yeah, help to, to make sure that we're sustaining this action going forwards. Yeah, incredibly important. Next question, please. Uh, yeah, gentleman there. Hello, Stuart Dainton. I work for the National Forest. Um, I just would uh, like to pick up on the point of hope that Lord Deben gave about um, the environmental sector working together now with people, health, etc. Um, how now do we then join forces to win the war? If we were fighting the battle, how do we win the war? And is it now time for COBRA? Lord Deben, do you want to pick that one up? Quite difficult for me to refuse to pick it up. As I, <laughs> um, well, first of all, I do think we have to uh, talk amongst each other better and work together better. And uh, the change in the National Forest, if I may say so, and the change in forestry generally has been enormous. I mean, I remember when um, they were the enemy. I mean, you couldn't get anybody to to, to deal with the... the, the, the um, uh, it, it was really difficult because there was a, a failure to understand that this was that forestry was a crucial part of what we were trying to do, and uh, we needed a forestry industry as well as forest open to people, and we needed choices that had to be made. The, dis, the invention of the national forest was, I think, a huge breakthrough. I even had something to do with it. I'm very keen indeed that we should do that, and so. Uh, Everybody has got to work together, and the one way which we don't, we are siloed in this country in lots of ways, and we really ought to try to be much closer to each other. Um, and I think the other thing is that uh, we, we've got to recognise the small things as well as the big things. I was so pleased that you mentioned the, the whole issue of uh, being within a quarter of an hour of, 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 of a wild place. Uh, too often we think of the countryside as what we're talking about. The, the Victorians got it right with their parks. I mean, if you look at London, London is a wonderful city, partly, uh, perhaps overwhelmingly, because of the parks and the Clapham Common and the, all these other places which are alive with wildlife. We've got to do more of that, but it's the small things. And when we talk about trees, it's not just the national forest. It's ensuring that we have more trees in our streets, 
More trees in our gardens, less concrete and a few trees make all the difference. Few fewer insurance people believing that anywhere you put a tree is bound to undermine the house, which is absolute nonsense, but they will do that. Have a real go. We've just got to be better at thinking small as well as thinking big and working together to do it. Rachel Aldersgate Group, very much a, a model of uh, different sectors working together. We are. Um, I hope we, we've been leading the way. So the Aldersgate Group's been running for 15 years, and I think at the beginning of that period, it was quite unusual to have this combination of different sectors all sitting in a room together trying to problem solve together. Um, now we find we're kind of very much in demand and everybody wants to think in this way. Um, I think having also sat thinking about it from this point of view, there's a, a top-down way of solving it and a bottom-up way. Um, the top-down way is uh, we would love to see some much clearer cross-cutting strategies. So um, this, is much, this is easy to say and hard to do. But for example, w what about a land use strategy for this country, which actually thinks about both agriculture and biodiversity and housing and all the other ways that we want to use the land? Could we think about that in one go? Um, what about the planning system, which fits alongside that? What, how do we think about the priorities for that? What about an industrial strategy? that says here's what the future of our industries will look like as a whole and the way we want those to come together. Um, those are things that our members want to see in order that that will then filter down to policies that fit together and are kind of complementary to each other. I would just say that the bottom-up piece is um, very much to do with skills and education as well. Um, I've got an eight-year-old daughter and when she gets to be 15 and she's thinking about her future options, um, I don't want her to have a really boring conversation with a careers advisor that says, which GCSEs are you going to choose? Well, that's a bit earlier, isn't it? But anyway, and, you know, which A-levels are you going to choose and which university would you like to go to? Um, she should be understanding that the world is much more rich than that um, and that there is a, there's a whole kind of range of different um, paths available in life which will help to create the world that we want to see um, and we need to kind of grow our education and skills sectors enormously um, so that they can feed these future strategies that don't exist yet. Thank you. You've reminded me when I was uh, 14 I went to a careers teacher and they said what do you want to be and I said an environmental campaigner and they um, on their BBC B computer from the 1980s at the time they didn't have that. Uh, so he, he typed in the code for being a careers teacher and told me, gave me, told me that's what you need to do to become a careers teacher. And I ignored it, of course. Uh, next question, please. Uh, yeah, a gentleman has been waiting here, sorry. Yeah, thank you. Uh, hi there, Liam McAleese, Esme Fairburn Foundation. Um, a lot of, there's conversation at COP about adapting to dangerous climate change that we're already seeing, and we know that that is impacting vulnerable communities now, both globally, but, but also increasingly in the UK. Um, and I'd just be interested in the panel's comments on the extent to which um, we're ready for this in the UK now. Thank you. Lord Deedham, um, as the uh, former chair of the Climate Change Committee, which obviously had a remit, obviously, around climate adaptation as well, are we ready? No, not at all. Um, and the uh, five-year plan for resilience, which the government has to produce, surprisingly enough, every five years, <laughs> they, um, uh, was a very, very disappointing document. We had produced uh, a list of things that needed to be done beforehand, and uh, they didn't meet any, a whole range of these things, and in total certainly didn't meet that. I think we have to recognise how bad that is. I just take my own village. We've never, we've never been flooded as we have been flooded this about a month ago. Uh, houses which will now be uninhabitable for a year. Never considered that they were in the flood plain or that that happened. The River Deben was always thought to be a rather nice river. I'm afraid I'm, it's a rather unpopular river at the moment because it's flooded all those, um, all, all those homes. And, and we had people staying with us because we're just slightly higher land. And my daughter's house was the, neck of the first one that wasn't flooded. It just came literally lapped up on the, uh, on the edges. Never conceived of this happening. I only use this example because this is going to happen more and more. People will find things happening which they've never thought of because of the uh, effect of the, of the weather here. I think the big problem is that people have thought of climate change as something that's going to happen and it's likely to happen somewhere else. 
<laughs> and what is now happening is, and, and that's why I don't like talking about doing things for one's children and grandchildren. We should be doing things for us. Even at my age, this is happening here now to us. And if you want to help other people adapt, we've got to show them that we are adapting. And everything we do, we come back to the point about looking at everything through the lens of climate change. Everything we do, every new block of houses that we build, everything that we think about and plan, all the infrastructure, all that, we have to do thinking about a situation in which we will have more storms, more rain, more drought, and more heat than we've ever experienced before. And in those cases, we will either prepare right across the board uh, and at the same time repair right across the board, or we're not going to be ready, and we certainly aren't. Thank you. Joe, uh, there's a particular role, of course, that nature can play in helping us adapt to climate change. Yes, so um, I was actually, the question made me immediately reflect on how we've neglected the soil. And uh, I think that if you looked at, um, you know, we're lucky enough to have a director of climate change. She used to head up adaptation at the, um, at the Climate Change Committee and the, the recommendations um, on adaptation and resilience. Soil health was always, you know, up there as a priority that, that needed to be recognized. And then over on the other side, for climate mitigation, um, you know, soil carbon was in the mix, but there was always this sort of, you know, we get ourselves in a bind about, we can't measure it yet. So therefore, you know, maybe it's reversible. Um, uh, and so we can't put all our eggs in the basket of soil carbon. But if we brought mitigation and adaptation together, then soil would have been absolutely number one on the list, but we never did. Um, hopefully we're gonna get there, um, get there now. But um, uh, I think, yeah. Also, also, there's a huge opportunity for um, for wetland creation, um, which you know, to be supported through um, the reform of farm payments, um, but also through uh, private finance. Um, I had a, the opportunity to go and see a, a fantastic farmer called Richard Allen um, in Wiltshire, who is uh, one of the um, first cohort of farmers who've been involved in the Bristol Avon catchment market, um, which Wiltshire Wildlife Trust and Avon Wildlife Trust have led on with Entrade. Uh, and he was. Um, waxing lyrical about you know, how the opportunity to, um, to access biodiversity net gain um, through that marketplace has enabled him to turn on its head what his father always told him, which was, we've got to get the water off this land as quickly as possible. And now he's saying, we've got to hold the water on the land as much as possible. Um, and he's a big fan of beavers. Uh, anyway, so, yeah, but really inspiring to see you know, these fabulous wetlands that he's been able to create um, on, on his farm as a result of, of being able to access that, that private finance as, as well, along side countryside stewardship so big opportunity to be holding that water um, uh, and and obviously then you know that is by far the most cost effective way to be tackling flooding a lot of people don't realize uh, don't they that actually if you, the more carbon you put in the soil the more that soil holds water it, it makes it spongy, yeah. So, I mean, exactly, yes, you're right. Thank you for the prompt. Now, so, uh, by neglecting the soil, I mean, what we've, what we've tended to do is we've tended to, um, because we can rely on uh, bag nitrogen, it's like sugar. You know, bag nitrogen, you just, you just, it's, it's the, you're growing things in a chemical substrate, quick fix for the plant, and you don't therefore need to um, invest in the soil. Um, so, as a result, um, all the complex crop rotations which you use to return uh, organic matter to the soil, you don't need them anymore. So the, the soil is degraded, which means that the, the organic matter is what holds the carbon. It also makes the, uh, the soil spongy. It makes it absorb water and hold it really effectively. Um, so uh, it is the secret to making sure that your crops do much better in a drought. Um, uh, they tend to also have to work a little bit harder without the fertilizer, so the roots go deeper. So much more resilience from, from, from soil um, that has been uh, managed to maximize soil carbon, but also uh, yeah, just, just to have to cope without nitrogen fertilizer. We will come back to nitrogen fertilizer very shortly. We've got time for just a couple more questions. There's a gentleman, well, maybe I'll do three. A gentleman here, just very quickly, if we can. Yeah, I just wanted to come back to the, sorry, my name's Johnny Hughes. I think I'm here representing the Postcode Earth Trust tonight. Um, That's part of the come, People's Postcode Lottery. Yeah, part it? of the People's Postcode Lottery. Thank you, Craig. Um, I just wanted to come back to the COP, actually, in multi lateralism as a, as a mechanism um, for, for tackling climate change. In some ways, it's absolutely incredible, remarkable that 
180 plus countries come together in a, um, you know, now every year um, to discuss the future of the planet and how, can, how they can cooperate. But in some ways, it's an incredibly difficult and clunky me mechanism. And sometimes a race to the bottom, as, as, as we've seen with some of the text that's not been very successfully negotiated. Um, and I'm, you know, I always ponder how we could speed things up um, and maybe have something alongside this, 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 these incredible cops. I think the ray of hope this year actually has been the EU deforestation regulation. That is, in a sense, a regional block, the European Union passing a law um, which could be transformational if, it, if it's implemented properly. So I'd like the panel's top, I don't know, let's say two um, in, international mechanisms, and I'm thinking particularly about sustainable trade policies here, but there may be others which could sit alongside these international negotiations, which would really, really drive okay. systemic I'll, change. I know that's a big question. I'll come to the panel, ask them one each, please. Uh, because we're running out of time. Thanks. Uh, so each panel member, one thing that you think can speed things up outside of COPs, could be international mechanisms or or maybe not even international mechanisms. Caroline. Well, you touched on it yourself, I think, when you talked about trade agreements, because at the moment you've got this incredibly laborious, um, slow and ultimately unenforceable process that happens under the COP. And then meanwhile, you've got all of these free trade agreements that are being signed up to, which do have enforcement mechanisms that do mean that you can get fined if you don't actually deliver on them. Um, and so we need to make sure that in those trade agreements, we're properly building in all of the environmental concerns and regulations and all of the rest of it. So in fact, rather than having the trade agreement undermining the COP process, it's actually something that can help you enforce it. And if there was one quick treaty, if I could just cheat slightly, uh, that we need to, you know, get away from right now, because sometimes these enforceable treaties are doing the wrong thing, then that treaty that basically, you know, I'm so tired, what's it called, Craig? You know, this treaty, the, the one that means that you can't extract yourself from um, uh, oil, you can't say to a, uh, an oil company that you, um, you don't want them to be there in your country anymore, and they can sue you as a result. Yes, um, the uh, foreign direct liability stuff, you mean? No, you mean something else? No, I mean something else, and I can't... Alien tort... No. No, it's, it's, <laughs> it's a really well-known treaty that everyone's talking just around just now. And we're trying... And it's many the non-proliferation. No. no. And, and some EU countries... The fossil fuel non-proliferation, no. Some EU countries have already got out of it, and we need to speed up getting out of it. Otherwise, if we say to a fossil fuel company, we don't want you to... Oh, yes. Sorry? Anyway, yes. It, it's, it stops you from doing it, and we need to stop that thing. <laughs> that one. Okay, thank you. Uh, Rachel. Google it now. I know. Carbon pricing, uh, both at sectoral level and at regional level. I know that carbon pricing's had a dicey history, but if you look at, for example, Corsia in the aviation sector, um, it's gone very, very slowly, but it is gradually ramping up. And it does have an understanding from the aviation sector that they are going to have to change. It needs pushing harder. Um, and maritime is even further behind Corsia, uh, so it's not working quite yet, but it's gradually getting there and it's working faster than the overall UNFCCC process. The same is true of regional level carbon pricing, so the EU ETS actually has teeth now, it's taken 15 years, um, but it works. And those things can work, and in you know, parts of America as well we've seen carbon, carbon pricing be effective. So I would say... Um, Global agreements on everything are more or less impossible, but if you can break it down a bit and apply a price, um, that's the best way to drive change. Thank you. Lord Eben. Uh, nationally, uh, put into the Planning Act that no planning permission may be given without taking climate change into account. And internationally, getting much closer back to our relationship with the European Union. It was a scandal that we left. It's done a huge amount of damage, and we need to work with them as closely as we possibly can. Thank you. And Joe? Oh, perils of being the last in the in the queue this time because I would have t definitely majored on trade deals um, uh, so instead I'll say extending so the the initiatives that there are internationally around um, uh, sustainable soy they need to be extended to uh, across all sustainable commodities uh, and when it comes to and we'll 
inevitably going to be coming back to soy and and uh, and what, what represents progress on soy. But soy, the whole agenda around soy has been um, has been uh, around trying to cut out deforestation. Um, but a, a huge amount, a huge um, area, as I said, of Brazil is devoted to growing soy for uh, industrial livestock, um, and the pesticide use associated with that is uh, mind-boggling. The, Pesticide use in Brazil has gone up 900%, uh, and it's all associated with producing the soy. Uh, so we need to make sure uh, that the action um, on soy is also looking at the pesticides used associated, uh, yeah, phasing out hazardous pesticides as well. Pesticides which are banned in the EU and the UK are being used on the soy, which is then imported to feed chicken that we eat in the UK. Uh, so action to uh, try and uh, stamp that one out. Okay. Could I quickly just say Energy Charter Treaty? It was ah, going to yes. give me so much pain. I had to Google it, but I found it. And the Energy Charter Treaty allows fossil fuel companies to sue governments if governments try to yes, break the course. contract they've got with them. Yes. Phew. I'm embarrassed to admit, Caroline, I was checking timings when you were talking. You asked me as well. But anyways, I didn't, that's why I didn't quite get it. Uh, we've got time for two more questions. Yeah. Uh, just, just there at the back, please. And then I'll come to this lady here. Right. As brief as you can, please. Okay. Hi, I'm Aaron Matthew, uh, U Forum for the Wildlife Trust, BCN. Uh, both Lord Deben and Ms. Caroline Lucas mentioned uh, climate action not resting on the shoulders of a younger generation. So do you guys believe that there's been a uniform approach or becoming a uniform approach multi-generationally to climate action? You want to take that? I'm not sure I entirely understood the question. So is the question, is there already a multi-generational approach to climate? Is there already or are there... I mean, I don't think there is, and I think there needs to be. Right. Um, and I think we need to make sure that it doesn't become a real kind of fault line in terms of, of um, intergenerational anger. I mean, I would have absolutely um, huge sympathy with young people who feel really furious with um, the old generation because we haven't we haven't left this place in a, in a decent state for you. And if I can just have one idea of a, of a policy that could make a, a difference, albeit I know um, Lord Deben was just uh, counselling us against thinking about future generations too much because it's here and now. Mm. But in Wales, they have a, a Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, which is, which is beginning to work in terms of making sure that when decisions are being taken, there is a perspective on how does this affect kids and our grand grandkids and so forth. And I think if we could really build that in, to a policy-making process, then we could have some better outcomes and hopefully more of an intergenerational approach. I'd just like to remind you that there are some older people who are busy <laughs> fighting very hard on climate change and have been doing it since they were relatively young. So I just wish to <laughs> say that we're not all in the same box. But the fact is, um, it is hugely important to mobilise young people. And that's why one of my biggest things to say to all of you is, we lost the vote on the uh, referendum because young people who were in favour of remaining didn't vote. It's a matter of voting. And it doesn't matter in a sense what you vote, but you need to be out there and vote. And I do think that's one of the things that we really do need to make this next generation a, a generation which sees that it must be part of the system if the system is to change. And, and it's crucially important. Great. Thank you. Can we get a final question? This lady's been waiting very patiently here in the middle for a while. Thank you. George Short from Sussex Wildlife Trust. Um, I just wanted to comment briefly on the fact that the marine environment is very... Um, rarely spoken of in these conversations even tonight it's kind of barely been touched on um obviously we're 70 percent sea on this planet and we're an island nation um so i just wondered what your reflections were on why that's not in the political consciousness and how we could make it so thank you and and i might come back to you in a minute for a sentence about what sussex wildlife trust is doing but let's just ask the uh, panel just quickly anyone wants to build that joe wiltshire doesn't have any sea <laughs> <laughs> Not authorised to comment. <laughs> <laughs> but you have rivers that go into the sea. And, yeah, we do indeed. And, uh, <laughs> and, do indeed. and nutrients. <laughs> Let's get back to nutrients about, that go into the sea as well. Yeah, uh, yeah and, and I think some of the most compelling images which, um, in, which remind us of how... Um, yeah, we are mismanaging our soil. There are those images from the air where you can see the, the, the soil um, just billowing out into the estuaries. Um, so you're right, we cannot separate the two. Um, so yeah, source to sea. I say kelp. 
just just because Sussex Wildlife um, have done such amazing work around regenerating the kelp um, forests off the Sussex coast, and they've got a wonderful From the Wheel to the Waves program. So you quite rightly um, take us up on, on the fact that we haven't celebrated some really good stuff that's happening out there, but also recognising, as you, as you kind of suggest, that it is massively important and totally integrated with all of the stuff we've been saying so far. There's a really straightforward point about visibility as well and how, um, you know, we, we're not at the seaside every day. We don't see that around us unless we're very lucky. Um, and also it's about ownership. So for the same reason as it's really difficult to get shipping to change how it behaves, um, it's really difficult to get change around how the sea is managed because of the multilateral approach to that. So it's kind of combination of out of sight and also complex ownership structures, um, which means it, yeah, it's much more complicated to do than land management, even though land management is already really complicated to do. Lord Eden. Well, I'm a trustee of Blue Marine and We've already moved the amount of areas now protected enormously in the last few years. One has to say the government has helped enormously because it has taken all those tiny islands and the confetti of uh, empire and helped them to use their uh, protected 200 mile to turn them into increasingly into protected areas. So we've moved from very small amounts of, them, of the seas being protected to a much larger, not enough yet, but well on the way to that. Um, and the question of kelp and, and sea grass, and there's a great deal more work now being done round the coast will make a huge difference. We could change a great deal by doing one thing, and that is that we should ban bottom trawling. It is utterly unacceptable that we should be cutting up the bottom of the sea, releasing the carbon from it and making it less able to take the carbon in, and at the same time destroying the food chain upon which the fish in the end depend. And why we cannot get, it, we, took, took, we had to take them to court, Blue Marine took them to court, to get the government even to stop it in marine protected areas. We need to make it illegal and we need to have an international agreement that, uh, that bottom trawling is unacceptable anywhere in the world. Thank you. Please just give us a sentence or two about the amazing work that the Sussex Wildlife Trust is doing on, on kelp off the Sussex coast. Am I turned off? There we go. Very connected to the sentiments around um, bottom tow gear. So we have um, the UK's largest marine rewilding project in Sussex um, with the focus on essential fish habitats and the restoration of kelp. The idea of this is to remove human pressures and let nature lead in its own recovery. Um, we aim then to kind of make an evidence base for how that mechanism will work and hopefully provide that data set for policymakers to enforce similar bans on bottom toed um, gear in other areas of the UK. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for all the questions tonight from this audience here at Hogan Lovells in London. And let's just think about how all those issues, the questions we've heard tonight, are linked. We've heard about the clearance of rainforest in South America to make way for soil plantations and the devastating impact that has on nature and of course the climate in South America and the loss of carbon, yes, from the rainforest in South America but also for the loss of carbon from the soils there. But to grow soya that's then imported here, for example to the UK and many other places, to then feed in intensive poultry units to feed chickens in intensive poultry units in catchments like the River Wye uh, and then having to create those millions, billions of birds, actually chickens, to feed our supermarkets and, and uh, the demand for cheap meat here in Britain. The result of that is of course then an environmental disaster here in the River Wye with the runoff of those, those nutrients, that pollution, into the River Wye catchment, causing a disaster not just in Brazil, and not just in South America, but a disaster here in the River Wye catchment as well, leading to that pollution and the death in many cases of the river. And this eutrophication, this nutrient pollution running through the River Wye, that then goes out to the coast, making it much harder for organisations like the Wildlife Trust to try and restore and rewild the coast with sea grasses, for example, which cannot be done if there's too much nutrient pollution in the coastal area, or indeed with kelp as well. Both of those are fantastic natural climate solutions, nature-based solutions, but we can't do it if the water is over polluted. So these issues link up in this extraordinary way, all the way from Brazil, right through to the River Wye, 
associated with our diets back out down our rivers, back out to our coasts, with soils impacted along the way as well. So all these issues are linked between climate and nature through that food chain and through those, uh, domestic, those supply chains there as well. And that we've touched on all of those questions tonight, but it's actually all part of one joined up story. So look, if you've enjoyed this Wild Live tonight, this is the last Wild Live of 2023. You can watch any of our previous Wild Lives on the Wildlife Trust YouTube page. We've got a huge back catalogue now of any, any number of issues that you can watch. Uh, you can even watch them speeded up as well if you don't want to watch them at normal speed uh, and just see how funny it is watching me talking at twice speed or whatever. Uh, but it's worth doing that. There's an, um, we've had amazing panics over the last two, three years and it's absolutely worth watching them. I want to take the opportunity to really thank hugely the private donor that's helped pay for all the kit here tonight as well uh, that has enabled this to happen. And I won't say it who's, but I, that person's here tonight. So I want to say a huge thank you for sponsoring these wild lives uh, to enable them to happen and the travel associated with it as well. So thank you very much for that. We're going to be back in the new year, in the very first week of uh, 2024. We're going to be at the Oxford Farming Conference in the Oxford Real Farming Conference with our next Wild Live. That's on the 4th of January uh, and that's going to be really trying to ask whether it's time to put the so-called food versus nature debate to bed. Uh, and we've got a brilliant panel coming together for that. You can get tickets to come in person on that in Oxford for the 4th of January. Just look on the Wildlife Trust website and obviously also register to watch and take part online as well. Um, I do want to finish, of course, by saying a huge, huge thank you again to our brilliant host tonight, Hogan Lovells, uh, the global law firm, not just for hosting us tonight, but having us as their charity partner for the last four years. They've been an absolutely superb supporter of the Wildlife Trust over the last four years, and we're very, very grateful to Hogan Lovells for everything they've done. Uh, but we also want to finish tonight on the subject of hope. Uh, with a hugely exciting video to share from you because this year, earlier this year, the Wildlife Trusts announced a extraordinary project, a deal with Aviva, uh, the huge insurer. Uh, they were supplying us with £40 million to restore temperate rainforests here in the UK. Uh, and this was a 100-year contract to do this, a contract which Hogan Lovells helped us at the Wildlife Trust negotiate with Aviva. Uh, it was a contract that I signed. You can imagine that's not often you sign a 100-year contract for 40 million quid to restore temperate rainforest. I did it with a nice glass of whiskey as I looked through the fine print. But uh, with re huge thanks to Hogan Lovells for helping us on that contract. And of course, massive thanks to Aviva for that 40 million pound donation to make it possible. And we thought we'd finish tonight with this video of hope as to what can be done. Good night. We're deep in the middle of a genuine climate crisis. I mean, this is an extraordinary period in geological history. We know we're going to get stormier, droughtier, more extreme weather. We're in a nature emergency, one in six species threatened of extinction in the UK, one of the most nature depleted countries on earth. But we're also in an economic emergency, especially in these rural communities. So we're seeing agricultural payments decline, the subsidies that we give to farmers. And we already know that upland sheep farming in particular is, is uneconomic. What this project is about is about saying, can we create a new economic reality for people living and working in this countryside? It's an economic reality based upon the regeneration of nature or the recovery of nature rather than its degradation. The Atlantic Rainforest Restoration Programme is essentially in concept a pretty simple project. We're gonna acquire about 2,000 hectares of land we're going to plant trees on that. We're going to look after those trees for hundreds of years. And eventually those trees will turn from a young forest into wonderful, rich Atlantic rainforest that'll be there forever. And as that rainforest starts to grow, it will pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. We'll measure that carbon by looking at the number of trees, how thick they are, and we can turn that into carbon units. And we'll give those carbon units to Aviva that can, can retire them out of the system as part of their journey to net zero. We knew that we had to reduce our own carbon emissions as a company, but 
also we knew that we couldn't just do that by ourselves. We decided that we would fund a hundred million pounds worth of nature-based solutions. So we chose the Wildlife Trust to provide us with some projects that would not only help sequester carbon, but also public access for the local communities, restoration and enhancement of biodiversity, and also a little bit about research and, and understanding what we've actually lost as a country and how we can help get that back again. I'm Fabienne Gress, I work at Hogan Lovells and we're a global law firm and that specialises in commercial law and we're really delighted within the UK to have our partnership with the Wildlife Trust who for the past four years has been our dedicated UK charity partner. It was wonderful to figure out you know, the different elements of pro bono legal advice that we've been able to offer, the Aviva deal which has helped to unlock almost £40 million. As far as I know there's never been an arrangement like this where we're using the Woodland Code to determine the carbon that's going to be generated, the charitable aspect of the process activities, the biodiversity, the whole thing is a completely new venture. So obviously it was, it was new ground for us in many ways. I love the outdoors, I love wildlife, I love trees, and it's wonderful to be able to help and use the skills I have from commercial contract work to, to help an organisation like the Wildlife Trust, which does such wonderful things. To be a project manager, creating a temperate rainforest is not something that you come across very often. So I'm very excited to be working on such a new project, not just to Wales, but to the whole of the UK. And I can't wait just to get, get a hold of the project and get, get on with it. When we heard that this fantastic farm was going to be on the market, up just in the hills here above Clonog Bower, only because of the donation that the Wildlife Trust had received via Aviva were we even able to think about acquiring that piece of land. It's the chance to re-establish Celtic rainforest that once would have clothed the slopes of Bulch Mawr here behind me, to manage a wonderful SSI SAC designated wetland, and to demonstrate beyond that that the future of farming has a place here, and to take that vision out to others.